Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host, John Lorden, and today's episode is for May 31st, 2017. Um, I was contacted last week by a Twitter account called Find Sarah, Find Jacob. And what I saw on that Twitter account was pictures of two very cute children. Uh, and of course, I told that Twitter account, we will cover this as soon as we can. So here we are um, to talk about this case. It, it's a little bit tough. Um, we have some very extreme circumstances going on here that are making it difficult for authorities to investigate. We're going to talk about that a bit as well, but I really want to remain focused on the fact that um, there are two children missing here and we need to do everything we can to try to find them and bring them home. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at what I have on my screen. This first website is find Sarah, find jacob.com. Uh, this is kind of the official website into the investigation. And we can see many pictures here of the two Jacob Hoggle and Sarah Hoggle that are missing. Um, they've been missing since September 7th, 2014. Uh, I believe one of them actually goes missing the following day, but we'll get into, yeah, uh, Sarah was actually last seen on September 8th of 2014. Um, missing from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, for Jacob Hoggle, his date of birth is July 3rd, 2012. Uh, he is two years old at the time that they printed this poster. He is a male. He is biracial. Uh, he has light brown hair, very cute, curly, light brown hair. You can see in the picture there. Uh, his eye color is also brown. His height is three feet and his weight is about 30 pounds. Uh, then we have his sister, Sarah Hoggle. Uh, missing since September 8th, 2014 from Gaithersburg, Maryland as well. Date of birth is November 20th, 2010. Uh, her age at the time of this poster would have been three. Um, she is a female, biracial, brown hair, brown eyes, three feet, six inches tall, and weighed about 40 pounds. Now keep in mind, this is almost three years ago now, so uh, these children are likely to be a bit taller and weigh a little bit more as well. Jacob was last seen on September 7th, 2014 at approximately 4 p.m. Sarah was last seen on September 8th, 2014 at approximately 5 a.m. Jacob and Sarah are biracial. They are black and white. Jacob was last known to be wearing a white t-shirt and blue shorts. Sarah was last known to be wearing a pink tank top and blue shorts. Um, there's some other stuff on this page that we'll get into. Um, I'm going to save it for the end. In particular, there's a lot of photos of Sarah and Jacob that I want to show you guys so that we get a very good sense of what they look like and what you should be looking for out there uh, if you are helping to look for them. Jumping over to missingkids.com, which is the official website for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, we get pretty much the same information here, but they have new age progression photos that I wanted to show you. So here we have Sarah with her age progressed, and I believe these were released um, fairly recently. I think within the last few months, uh, these age progressions came out. And here we have an age progression on Jacob. So this is probably what they will look like uh, nowadays if you happen to see them somewhere. Okay, so before we jump into the details of the timeline, um, I just wanna kinda lay out who we're talking about here. We have the mother, her name is Catherine Hoggle. Um, she has struggled throughout her life. She's been diagnosed with several things throughout the period of her life, including um, bipolar disorder, but uh, now they think that she is actually a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, she has a boyfriend, um, I guess it, he would be considered a common law husband at this point. I think they've lived together long enough, uh, named Troy Turner, and they have three children together. Um, only these two children are missing. There's actually a third child whose identity has not been revealed publicly. Um, he is two years older than Sarah, so I believe now he would be about nine years old. Um, they know where he is, but these two, specifically Jacob and Sarah, are still missing. And we're going to find that the mental um, disability challenges that Catherine have faced, has faced uh, have put a very 
a different type of strain on law enforcement than I've seen before in any case like this. So uh, let's take a look at the timeline of events. This is from the Bethesda patch at patch.com. On September 7th, Catherine Hoggle borrowed her father's gray 2012 Nissan Rogue SUV and said she was picking up pizza for Jacob. She returned three hours later without the boy or pizza and told her parents she had left Jacob at a playmate's house. Now, um, around these issues that she's been dealing with and struggling with, uh, her boyfriend and immediate family members have tried to make systems to kind of keep her protected, where essentially there's always another adult around her. So this is already a little bit of a strange situation that she's borrowing her father's vehicle and taking one of the children away from everyone else, then comes back without the child a few hours later. Um, and unfortunately, Troy, her boyfriend, won't learn about this for almost a full day. Um, but let's continue with the timeline. On September 8th, Hoggle left home with Sarah and told Turner she was taking the child to a daycare center. That afternoon, when Turner asked about the children's whereabouts, Hoggle would not tell him where the children were. Both Hoggle and Turner set off for the police station, but stopped at a Chick-fil-A near the Germantown Transit Center where Hoggle left the restaurant without Turner noticing and disappeared. On September 12th, Hoggle was found and arrested in Germantown. Okay, so there's a lot going on in that uh, paragraph. Let's let's try to break it down a little bit. Um, Troy has been very public and has been interviewed many times and has spoke about what has happened. According to him, he got home extremely late the night before, like after midnight, and um, his girlfriend, Catherine, asked him to stop at the store and pick up a bunch of stuff. And he's even wondering at this point, was she doing that on purpose to delay him getting home? Because uh, Jacob likely was not at the house at this point. Um, the next morning, he says that he wakes up and it's his oldest son that actually wakes him up and says that he doesn't know where his mom is. He doesn't know where anyone else is. And it seems like uh, she has taken the family van and left. She then comes back. Uh, Troy is asking her what's going on. Where are the kids? She says, don't worry about it. I've taken them to a daycare center. Uh, Troy is asking, where is this daycare center? What's the phone number? She says, I don't know. And that's when he starts getting really upset. They jump in the car and they go driving and he says, take me to the daycare center. She tries to take him there, but can't seem to find it. So at this point, um, I believe he drops off the oldest son with some family members because he's starting to get very upset with her. And he decides he's going to drive her to a police station. On the way there, she says, I need to stop and have a drink. I think she needed a Dr. Pepper, if I recall properly. Um, she's saying that because of all the medications that she's constantly taking, uh, she occasionally would have to have, you know, caffeine kicks and sugar kicks here or there to kind of get her through the day. So as they stop there to get her drink, she then disappears on him. So now he's probably feeling like there's something seriously wrong. Um, she is essentially on the run for a number of days, but on September 12th, police do catch up to her. There is a bit of a foot pursuit from what I understand that goes down, but they do capture her. They bring her in and they're able to question her. All right, let's go back to the timeline here. On November 6th, it was revealed in court that Hoggle allegedly told her mother she could take the police to where the children are. Hoggle's lawyer said she did not want to go, and Judge Eugene Wolf refused to sign an emergency order for her to leave Clifton T. Perkins Hospital Center. So what has happened in between her being captured and that court date is she initially was in police custody, but once they found out about her um, disorders, she was moved to a state mental institution to be further analyzed. Once she got there, the people that were analyzing her were saying that um, she's not competent, essentially, that she should not be interrogated um, and she's not competent to even stand against charges that maybe she has done something to the children. So that's where we get into this very bizarre catch-22 where investigators are not able to ask the person last known to be with the children, where are these kids? 
On November 17th, a psychiatric evaluation of Catherine Hoggle was submitted by Clifton T. Perkins Hospital Center, finding her not competent to stand trial. So what you have at that point is police who think based on their initial interview, because they did get to interview her a little bit when they first captured her, um, they said that the story changed a few times there. And in their opinion, they were dealing with a homicide investigation. They weren't dealing with a missing persons case. Now, from everything else that I can see, her family and people that have talked to her, she keeps insisting the kids are fine. I've taken them to someone, but I can't tell you who. Um, I think actually she even dropped a first name. We're going to bump into it a little bit later. But um, she keeps insisting that she has taken care of the kids, that they are alive and well and being cared for by someone. Is this really true? Is this just spin that she's putting out there to try to avoid um, charges? We're not sure. That's kind of the big question in this whole case. And it's a question that's literally been going on for years now, um, frustrating not only her boyfriend, Troy, uh, but her, her own mother even as well. Um, it is also worth noting that Troy, when he speaks about this case, uh, he also talks about the fact that he was kind of pulling away from her in that in that last period of time where the kids went missing. Uh, he's even wondering if potentially that might have something to do with the kids missing at this point. Um, you know, he he was allowing himself to stay living with her. He really wanted his kids to have their mother. But even around all that, it seems like he was starting to pull away from her emotionally. I don't know if there was anyone else in the picture, or if he was spending time with anyone else and she found out about it. We don't have anywhere near that amount of detail, but he does just seem to um, be putting information out that uh, maybe she had thought that, um, or maybe she noticed that he was pulling away. All right, let's continue over to the Washington Post, mother of missing Kids keeps trying to escape from Maryland Psychiatric Hospital. Here we have a picture of all of them. Catherine Hoggle has repeatedly tried to escape from a maximum security psychiatric hospital where she has been held for 18 months. At least eight times, according to court records, she grabbed a staff member's security badge, run towards the door of her locked unit, and occasionally made it beyond that first barrier. Through her hospital stay, Hoggle has said her children are safe and that she wants to see them. She's been hospitalized on a few occasions before, and apparently on one of those occasions, she actually did escape from the hospital uh, where she was staying. And a few times that she was hospitalized, uh, it was not by her own choice. It was, it was uh, essentially she was being committed by family members, so... Um, does Hoggle's level of schizophrenia make her too delusional to take part in court proceedings? Or is she gaming the system and using a medical finding of mental incompetence in an attempt to avoid life in prison? Uh, it's a pretty tough question, um, but if we talk about the history just that we know of her already, she had to be setting this up like since she was a teenager or something like that. I mean, that's apparently where they started noticing she had trouble. Uh, I think even before that, they noted that she was, uh, that she had ADHD. Um, they gave her some medication for that. Then later in life, it was bipolar disorder. So um, there's been this constant, you know, for me personally, to think that she's gaming the system, I don't know if I buy it because there's enough of a history here. And you know that old saying where there's smoke, there's fire. There's been plenty of smoke around her for a long time. So I'm not positive that I believe that she is truly gaming the system. However, it gets a bit tough when you have her own mother coming out with information like this. Catherine understands precisely what is going on, wrote her mother in an affidavit, Lindsay Hoggle, who added that her daughter's IQ was once tested at 135. Um, still, I got to say, going through being hospitalized several times, going through all these medication changes throughout her whole life, I'd, I'm, I'm really having trouble buying that she is gaming the system here. Possibly she's taking advantage of um, her situation where she has been struggling and now she's done something wrong and she doesn't want to face up to that. So now she's kind of rolling back. But the thing is, there's a defense there. If she really is having this kind of trouble, um, is she going to be held legally accountable anyway if they try to actually take her to trial for murdering her children? 
I don't know that it would stick, um, in particular with her history that has gone on and now with her being hospitalized uh, for the most recent at least two years at this point. So I am not positive. Uh, Hoggle has needed intense supervision, often with a dedicated staff member staying within arm's reach and at least twice has assaulted other patients without provocation. If she were found competent and if she were charged with killing her children, which officials have indicated they would do, Hoggle could file Maryland's version of an insanity plea. It is called, quote, not criminally responsible, meaning that mental illness kept her from knowing she was committing crimes. So right there, it's pretty much spelled out that if she is going to play this up for defense, she's probably in the absolute best position to do that right now. However, it appears from the actions that she's taking and from some of the more recent things that are happening in court, she does not want to face this at any point. Um, people around her are saying that she's under the belief that eventually they're just going to let her out of the hospital system and she's just going to be able to walk free and not have to face um, any kind of charges for this. So uh, very, very strange stuff going on in this case. Under questioning by detectives, Hoggle spoke only in vague terms about the children, at one point saying she had left them with an old friend identified only as Aaron. In his affidavit, Hoggle's ex-boyfriend Turner said he has spoken with Hoggle on the phone while she has been at Perkins, and Hoggle told him she planned to remain incompetent so she never reaches trial. She justifies it to me by saying that their two missing children are alive and okay, Turner said. Um, what's interesting is in the initial interview that police did with her when they first captured her, they said that she was kind of talking like that initially, but then the language changed and she was saying that she had left her children somewhere. Um, when her boyfriend has tried to speak to her about where they're left, she says that, uh, it would do him no good to know because she has to go there to pick them up and she has to take the police there with her. So I don't know. It's kind of cryptic. Some people I'm sure would assume that that means that she has done something bad in this situation. Um, but surprisingly, uh, Tony and other family members of hers even are holding on to that hope that the children are still alive somewhere just waiting to be found. Over at baltimore.cbslocal.com, we get an update just from April of this year. Um, Catherine Hoggle appears in court. Still no answers on children's whereabouts. Catherine Hoggle said nothing in court while family members are keeping up hope that her children will be found. Psychiatrists say Catherine Hoggle is making progress on her mental health, but not enough to be considered legally competent to stand trial. And they've set another court date to check in on this again in July of 2017. Um, and this is the problem with this case. This is why I'm struggling with this case a little bit because I'm really trying to focus on these kids as missing people. And as you can see, even with the media coverage, it gets pulled to the story about Catherine and how she is avoiding questioning by the police and the challenges that she's going through. Um, it's very important that we pull it back and we remember it's about Sarah and it's about Jacob. And back here at findsarahfindjacob.com, um, these are photos of the children so we can get a bit more of an idea of what they look like in person. Just wanted to be I just wanted to be sure to uh, share these with you so that if you do happen to see these kids somewhere, you might know. And also worth mentioning, um, if they are indeed being cared for by someone else uh, with the age that they're at, um, you know, I would say Jacob might not even be aware that he's in that situation. Uh, Sarah was also very young. She might not know that she's even uh, in a kidnapping situation. There's been some conversation about them possibly being taken to um, Amish country in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not really sure. I've kind of heard that theory come up before in missing person cases pertaining to children. Uh, I think it's a common theory because people are trying to consider uh, where would you take a child and actually be able to hide them um, so well in particular. 
There is also a uh, GoFundMe that has been set up for Find Sarah, Find Jacob. And once again, thank you to my amazing Patreon supporters on behalf of Searchlight and all of you guys. We are going to be donating to this GoFundMe as well. And hopefully this will help Troy. Um, they have been just spending tons of money on posters. And I think I've even seen information uh, possibly about PIs kicking around. Um, he's had to, of course, go back to work. So funds like this can help him take time off. So we are going to be donating to that just as soon as I'm done filming here. There is also a Facebook page, Find Sarah, Find Jacob. I'll have a link to that down below as well. And I wanted to point out um, mymcmedia.org. They have a lot of local media about this case. A lot of the interviews that I'm talking about, you can reference through here. Um, they also have a pretty good YouTube uh, page that has a bunch of videos on this, but it's hard to find them directly from their YouTube channel because uh, they have so many videos. So you might want to come here to mymcmedia.org, do a search on the name of the family, on uh, probably Catherine Hoggle in particular, uh, or Troy Turner, and that should get you links to all those video clips that I'm talking about. Also want to give a quick shout out to The Vanished Podcast, who just covered this last week. And typically when I see um, what I consider one of my contemporaries cover a case, I'll actually wait a bit to give it some time. Um, but for this one, I felt like it was too important. I really wanted to get the information out there. The Vanished Podcast did a very good job retelling this story. If you want to get a bit more insight into the background of Catherine, you will get that here. If you want to hear several of the interviews that I'm talking about, um, the audio from those interviews is also included here. Uh, and on top of that, she also got to interview Troy. So very well, well done piece. Um, I really like the Vanish podcast. We follow each other on Twitter. I'm, I'm a really big fan of how she puts information together. So if you want to dive deeper into this, um, you've got a podcast here that is almost 50 minutes long on this case. Outside of that, Web Sleuths has a good healthy thread. Um, towards the end, I'm noticing that there's a lot of comments where people are just trying to discuss um, the feasibility of her faking this and... I don't know if that's really the most important thing to be looking at in this case, um, but it is tough not to focus on it because we know that she's the last person to be with them and without having a, a ton of great information from her uh, on where to look to next, of course, everyone is focusing on her and her silence. So I kind of understand it, but it's really tough uh, in any case. Um, anyway, everyone, that is it for this episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Um, if you have friends in the Maryland area, please share this with them. Let's see if we can raise even more exposure to this case, get these kids seen by uh, more people out there, and hopefully someone out there has a piece of information that can help bring these children home. Um, my heart goes out both to um, Catherine's family members that are struggling around this and Troy, um, Troy has been speaking up in a few places. You can sense that there's some frustration and anger going on with him. Uh, in particular, her mother seems like she's kind of in line with Troy in terms of them being focused and believing the kids are still alive and being focused on finding them and bringing them home. So um, I think it's amazing that they are keeping up hope like that, particularly when you have the authorities basically come into the conclusion that this is a homicide investigation, even though they haven't found any bodies. Um, there is a chance. We really don't know. We're not dealing with someone that seems to um, obviously be ultimately trustworthy. But outside of that, we know that she's struggling with uh, mental disorders. She's taking all kinds of different medication or those having side effects on her perception of reality. There's a lot going on here. So the few, the very limited comments we do have from her about knowing where the kids are or the fact that they're being with someone how much are we supposed to believe in those? I, I really don't know, but the answer is out there somewhere and maybe you might have a piece that can help with that. So if you do, please use the contact information in the description box below. Um, and outside of that, there's plenty of links down there where you can look into this case, this case much deeper. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I hope you're having a very nice day. I'll catch you right back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arts channel.